mute that again. Real problems. Okay, that's all the notices over. Let's uh, get on with the service, shall we? Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you that your steadfast love never ceases. And that your mercies are new every day. Today, we ask for a fresh outpouring of your mercy. May we begin to understand the depths of your love. May we remember that you have lavished your great love on us so that we shall be called children of God. And as we walk through these turbulent times, let us walk as your children. Let us walk by faith in you and not by sight. And as we walk through the depths of this valley, may we see you in the very heights of your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship our God and we'll take up the offering during this first song. Thanks for the offering. Gracious God, guide us to use this financial offering given today and in other ways for the building up of your work in this church and the wider world. And as our young people go out to their groups, we ask for your blessing on them and their leaders. <laughs> the reading today is from Luke 4, beginning at verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone. The devil led him up onto a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdom of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time came. Matt. Thank you, Peter. I was going to say, it's lovely to be with you again, but I was thinking, when Peter said it's lovely to have you again, and I was thinking, when was the last time I came? And uh, I think we've divided recent times into before COVID and after COVID. So it was definitely before COVID, and I've worked for YMCA for 11 years, so it was sometime in the past decade, but it's wonderful to be with you uh, this morning and to share with you as well. Um, so my role at YMCA um, is that I'm the lead chaplain, so it's all about pastoral and spiritual care. So I want to share a bit with you about what YMCA does. It would be silly of me to come all this way uh, from Bushy and not do that, um, but also uh, uh, to be invited to come and to share what's on my heart for, for us and for you as a church this morning as well. So we work uh, across Bedfordshire, Hertfordshire and Buckinghamshire, um, and I'd like to just start by showing a very short video that kind of gives you a flavour, a taste of what that looks like for the people we serve.
Supporting people emotionally and spiritually is deeply rewarding. We work with a lot of our guys when they wear on the street and seeing them then going into their own homes, that's really rewarding. People who there's more comfort and love in their life. It's actually helped me to establish my body to get us back into shape and get us better again and feel healthier. The Family Centre Service provides lots of support to families, so we have different sessions they can come to, workshops, where they can just come in and get guidance and support around parenting and their child's development. It allows families to come together, make new friends, we meet lots of people and we have a lot of fun for the little work. One Mind Antioch has absolutely helped people thrive. I always look forward to coming to the gym, no matter what's going on in the day, I know there's always going to be a smiling face to greet me. But even better, I know that I can bring a smile to someone else's face. The staff here are very helpful. It obviously feels like a family. <coughs> Therapeutic and spoken support services are delivered by One YMCA and ECP. We deliver domestic and sexual abuse support services, therapeutic services and online counselling and play therapy, and a perpetrator support programme. We work with over 600 individuals at any one time. We deliver life-changing support. We empower them to move forward from the horrendous trauma they are working through. I really enjoy working with young people and finding a way to get through to them and then seeing that positive impact. We help young people's voices be heard by creating an environment that's safe, where young people can actually engage with them. We hired a school from the YMCA for our gymnastics club for five years and they have been supportive throughout this whole time. A warm, inviting place to come and meet their friends at the Woodlands Cafe. Lisa also makes some homemade cakes and we sell them to the local community. Central Services consists of HR, Finance, IT, Marketing. We try to help out and impact those that are working in the front end. This is our early childhood partnership. We support children and families around Bedford and the surrounding areas. We get loads of lovely feedback from families who have enjoyed their time here and have learned so much more things that they can do with their children. It's somewhere where we can all come together and let our children thrive. It's made life a lot, a lot better. Airplay is for our children to come along to a safe, fun environment and just be themselves. I can enjoy myself and I don't have to be in my house all the time. It's special to be a part of YMCA Nursery because I love watching them achieve their little targets and just have them smile every day. To be honest, I absolutely love it and I wouldn't change it for the world. Okay. So that gives you a flavour and a sense of what, what we're doing. In a second, I'll share a bit more locally, because you're thinking, well, that's lovely that it happens in Bedfordshire, but we're in South West Hertfordshire. Um, so if I could have the slides, it will just naturally, unfortunately, we'll just do that. We'll do, you just need to stop the video, Nigel. There we go. It does this wonderful thing where it just wants to keep showing you about stuff about YMCA every time you load it, which is not helpful for me when I'm just trying to watch the one thing for two minutes. There we go. So that's our founder. I want to take you back. I was going to say cast your minds back to 1844, but none of you were there. Um, so this George Williams, he was a young man. He was 22. He'd come to London. And the reason he'd come to London was he was a farmer's son from Devon, but he was a bit of a useless farmer. He had no aptitude for it. He'd overturned a cart full of hay in the middle of a storm because he wasn't concentrating. He was busy thinking about something else. So off he was sent to work with his brother, in the cloth trade in London. And when he arrived in London, it's 1844, it's the middle of the Industrial Revolution, there were lots of young men working 12-hour days, six days a week. And they were crushed by the work that they were doing. They had no hope. They were turning their lives to things that just were not good choices. Whatever it is you think might not be a good choice, that's what they were doing. And George was a young man and he said, I don't know what to do about this. So I'm just going to pray to my Lord and Saviour and ask for his help. What would he have me do in this situation? So he did. That's what he did. He didn't know what else to do, so he prayed. And then he started gathering some of the other young apprentices that he worked with, and they began to pray. And there was 12 of them in the room, the upper room, it was called, where they met. I don't know. That's how these things happen, isn't it? And uh, one by one, all the other young men that he worked with made a decision to follow Jesus. And... Um, and then other cloth traders said, well, we want some of that, that good stuff that's happening with those young men, we want some of that where we are as well. So other young men started to come together 
to share good news, to pray for each other, to read the Bible together, and it went from there. And then within five years, it was in Manchester and Birmingham, and then within 10 years, it had gone international. So the first YMCA International Conference was Paris in 1855, and there they decided that actually what was really important was that together they associated their efforts for the extension of God's kingdom amongst young people. It wasn't just young men, but young people. And anything else that they may or may not agree on, that's fine. But most fundamentally, it's about being and speaking good news to the young people where they are. And that was 180 years ago. And then today, as you can see, we do many different things as well. But at the heart of who we are as YMCA is to create a Christian environment inspired by the life, example and teaching of Jesus. Not everybody who works or volunteers for YMCA uh, is a Christian, and that is absolutely fine, of course. We have many different ways that we support people. But for us in the Christian Mission Team and within Chaplaincy, that's our role, to make sure that we are praying for each other, we're praying for the organisation, and we're there to help YMCA in its mission to bless people in body, mind and spirit. Can I have the next slide, please, Nigel? Thank you. So that just gives you a flavour of the impact that God has used YMCA for um, in terms of volunteer hours, 468 people moved into settled accommodation and so on. Um, family supported, young people sessions put on. So for us very locally, um, if you go into Watford, you will probably know our tablet. You may have seen the new, the renewed cross that's on top of the building. Can you see it from your house? I can see it from my house pretty much in Bushy the light on the top, well, it's there. And um, it's a wonderful sign that God's love is over our town, over our area um, here. Uh, so in that building in Charter House, we have 150 people experiencing homelessness that stay with us. Uh, some of them uh, are there because of relationship breakdown, addiction, um, unemployment, all sorts of reasons. Others are there and being supported by a complex needs service. So perhaps they've experienced multiple trauma in their lives. Maybe they have really very poor mental health. All sorts of different reasons why people are there. And we uh, help them over the course of two years to get back on their feet, to get the support they need to heal, to recover, whatever it is that they are needing uh, and wanting. And uh, we have a wonderful team of volunteer chaplains and others that come in alongside, serve tea and coffee, listen, because listening to people's stories is so important. Um, as well as that practical serving of refreshments and creating a safe space. And we pray with people. And we've seen lives changed um, by God's love, which is incredible. And then slightly further afield, we have our nursery and cafe in Leaveston Country Park. If you ever fancy a walk, a lovely walk, and you can get up there, then please, uh, please do that. And uh, buy coffee or cake in the cafe, because that helps keep me in a job. Um, not that I'm selfish, but please. No, not too much. God is faithful. And we also have our nursery there as well, a 100-place nursery um, up in Abbots Langley in Leaveson Country Park. And then slightly further than that, still within South West Hertfordshire, is our gym at St Albans, which you saw on the video as well. So, as I said, chaplaincy, we're one part of the, what the YMCA does, but we're also one strand of the Christian Mission Team um, as well at YMCA. And we're kind of the practical arm of that love and service. We're there to listen to our colleagues and to the people, the families, the young people, people experiencing homelessness, and to be God's hand and feet to them. But more broadly in the Christian Mission team, uh, you may know Reverend Tim Roberts, who's recently retired from leading Wellspring Church. He's our head of Christian Mission, and part of his role is to help the organisation understand what does it mean to live this out for Jesus? What does it mean to have these values of compassion uh, respect and growth. How do we live that out? Which I think is an important question for all of us, isn't it? Um, as we follow God's calling, but also for organisations too. So that gives you that. But what I'd really like to do is give you a practical demonstration of what that looks like, because I think that uh, helps me understand it better. So I will need some willing or unwilling volunteers to help participate in this. And we're just going to tell uh, someone's story. Can I have the next slide, please, Nigel? Nathan's story. Thank you. Um, and this is just obviously we've changed the name, but I hope that the story gives you an idea of how it is that we support people and how we see their lives changed. So I'm going to switch to a different microphone, so do excuse me. Oh, look at that. Seamless. Love it. Okay, so I'm going to...
going to I'm going to need someone to volunteer to be Nathan. I have someone that volunteered to be Nathan and that's the centre of our story. I don't mind who it is. Thank you so much. Now Nathan, you're about 18 years old. <laughs> is someone who lives at home with his mum. So Nathan, Nathan needs a mum. I'll be his mum. Thank you, Jill. I'll be there. Yeah. So if Nathan, if you can come and stand here, and then Jill just sort of, I mean, mum sort of stand over there. Okay, yeah. What, I've got quite a loud voice, so I'm going to try without the microphone. Okay, if you can't hear me, wave. Also, I've got feedback.
we're going to get you a mental health worker, a social worker. So, anybody fancy again being a social worker? Jane, you ready? Oh, she was. Okay. Bring you out of retirement, Holly. <laughs> And this social worker says, look, what we'll do, as long as you're a support worker, we can get you that help you need. So we'll help you with your recovery, we'll help you with all your health needs, we'll help you with your housing, where do you want to go, what is it you want to do with your life. And so eventually, after that support, building confidence again, uh, Nathan gets himself a new job, a new apprenticeship. So he needs a, a new employer. Sorry, pharmacist, you're not coming back into this picture. Uh, sit down. You can sit down if you like. Um, so he gets a new job, he gets a new job at the local airport. Anybody fancy working at the local airport? Come on out, son. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> We're all very good at nominating each other, I'm enjoying it. Sometimes it's really like pulling teeth, but not this morning. It's a great crowd. Right. You always wanted to work at the airport, didn't you? Yeah, there you go. It's a very good Oh, well, yeah, you can do that too. There you go. Yeah, that's it. So, he's then building his confidence. Yeah, you can see that there's a hope and there's a future and in the background of all these big support services is things like the Chatterton team, walking alongside, helping them understand the story, praying with them and saying, God's got you in the middle of this. And one of the great things that then happens is that from that place of feeling more positive and hopeful, and not everything of course in life goes straight forward all the time, actually, Nathan was then able to start start making connections again. So that's so often what I found is that that's what happens to people. They lose everything. They lose all of those connections. All of those really vital connections get cut. And it's at that moment that God is able to then say, okay, reconnect you up again. There is still more to your story to be told. And that's a really part of what we do at one again. Reconnect and we can pick up. Thank you very much. Give them all the words around. Okay, I have a second video to show you. This is the program we're running during Lent. Um, we know that for lots of people, uh, Lent in those six weeks leading up to Easter is the time where traditionally people have taken stock. Where is God calling me to love him more, love my neighbour in new and different ways or in just in refreshed ways? So if you thought from seeing that talk, actually this is something that maybe God's calling me to be part of, but I don't know what that's like, then perhaps these taster sessions might be for you. So, thank you, Nigel. Hello from the Christian Mission Team here at Fort Myers Bay to all our partners, churches, and friends as we prepare to celebrate Easter. For many, Lent is a time for spiritual renewal and reflection to consider how God is calling each of us to love Him and our neighbour. This year, we're offering fresh opportunities for you to partner with us and explore new ways of showing Jesus' love to people in your community or neighbourhood. This can be in the daytime or evening, and you could join volunteer chaplains and staff at one of our locations or sessions across beds, hearts and bucks. How would you be helping? Perhaps by offering listening ear to people experiencing homelessness over a cup of tea or a game of pool, with simple kindness and dignity. It could be shadowing our parish nursing team, exploring with you could combine faith and medical expertise to offer hope and reassurance. Or perhaps we can explore offering care to families, young people, or supporting people with their mental health is right for you. Either way, this Lent, we're here to help you find a fresh way to serve and bring hope and help to others in Jesus' name. Simply get in touch with one of our team to learn more. To do that, click the link below this video or scan the QR code. Thanks and God bless you. Thank you. You stop the video now. Okay, I will uh, send that round. Try again. 
Okay, we will, I will um, send that to Jill to pass around um, so you can watch it again and understand a bit more. And I'm really happy to chat at the end of the service today if that's what any of you would like to do about anything, really. Um, but if you're interested in coming and finding out more, then please do that. Okay. So, um, when I asked uh, Linda when she invited me to come and share this morning, I said, what would you like me to share? Do you have a program or a series? And she said, actually, I'd just like you to share whatever's on your heart for our church this morning. I thought, gosh, that's a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, I'm trusting uh, very much in God's grace this morning and the prompting of the Holy Spirit that this is what he wants to share with us individually and uh, as a church. And I'd like to reflect this morning on calling. Okay, next slide please, Nigel. Thank you. So, when God calls, stick with him. And we've already thought a lot about calling already this morning. So we thought about uh, the calling of YMCA to be good news locally, nationally and even internationally. Um, to work with all sorts of different people, to bless them. Um, the example of George Williams as a young man feeling called and prompted and inspired by the Holy Spirit to simply pray and to be led by God. Um, and again, as I said, that for us as one YMCA, the, the, the YMCA local here, to create that Christian environment modelled on the life example and teaching of Jesus so that everyone can receive and understand God's love for themselves and to flourish. So I think about te Jesus' teaching uh, and life and example this morning as we reflect on calling. So I just want to think firstly about calling and one of, the, one of those first things I thought about is that the trouble with calling is that we overlay it with a very human, in, human sense of what is important. Next slide please, Nigel. Okay, because what we do is that we say, all right, well we live in the world and what does the world say is your calling? Well, it could be your paid employment, couldn't it? The job, what you do. So when the, when the king comes around and says, and what is it that you do? Um, and then we think, oh, well, it, it must be what I'm paid to do. But actually, the way that God calls and the work, the work that God gives is far wider than employment. That's, that's one thing that we hear in the world. It's about what you do. But actually, God it says it can be as simple as caring for your family, raising your children, looking after a sick relative. God might put something on your heart to pray about and pray and pray and pray for, looking after the environment. So it's far wider than what we may get money for or to do or, or not to do. But also we can think, well, actually, it can't be for me because I'm not Billy Graham. I'm not standing at the front. I don't feel able to, to, to speak or to say anything. I don't think what I do is very important. But I don't think that's what God says either. And the reality is that our primary calling, the primary calling for all of us, is to take up our cross and to follow Jesus, Luke 9, 23. That's the primary calling. That's what we are invited to do every day, every moment of every day, in every situation. Take up our cross and follow Jesus. And then the secondary call is the place. It's the people. It's the location. It's the how. It's the when. Can we just go back? Sorry, Nigel, it's clicked a bit too far. Thank you. So yeah, we've got a primary call, always, every morning, follow me. That's what Jesus says. That's what he says to the fishermen, isn't it? Yeah? Follow me, and then I'll make you fishers of men, of people. Follow me, that's the first thing. And the second bit is left up to the Lord to show us and uh, invite us into and grow us into. And without that first bit, the follow me bit, um, the second bit would just be of our own thinking and imagination, wouldn't it? Actually, it would be... Well, I'll follow Jesus and then I think I'll do whatever I think is a jolly good idea. Yeah. But that's, or I fancy doing this or I don't fancy doing that. Um, but I think that's where submitting ourselves to Jesus allows all of that to fall away. And that secondary calling, I was talking with Tim this week, that secondary calling is actually what we spend the rest of our lives trying to figure out, really. And at different times and different places, it may look like different things. But preparation... Preparation to live out the call is part of that process. And I've been thinking back over my own journey to where I am with chaplaincy now. Um, and at the start of my journey, a long time ago, nearly 20 years ago, which is a bit scary, um, I was a university student. And I'd had these experiences that had rekindled my faith in Jesus. And I desired to love God with everything and to love my neighbour. 
And I knew that Jesus wanted people to love their neighbour, so it must be an active thing, so I must go and do something about this. So off I went to the uh, chaplaincy centre and started hanging out with them, which was a great way to get free coffee and avoid the library um, as well. And I would listen to people share their stories and tell them about how much Jesus loved them um, as well. And so I then started thinking about the future. Is this my calling? What do I need to do in response to that? So I asked a few different people. I asked the university chaplain, and he said to talk to his boss, who was high up in the Anglican church. And so I did. I had a chat with the regional minister of the Baptist denomination. Oh, yes. And uh, I signed up with Watford Town Centre Chaplaincy as well. If anyone remembers Richard Tudor from a long time ago, that's who was, who was, my, who was the lead chaplain at the time. Anyway... So I think that's what I've got to do. I've got to go out and explore, and I'll ask all these different people. And uh, on all, the di- all these different people said to me, you need training. And I was so gutted by that. I've just done A-levels. I've just been to university. I didn't want to do any more learning. I didn't want to do any more study. And all of them were saying, no, this, no one will take you unless you do some training. Um, and I just thought, well, perhaps... Well, surely if this is God-given, if this is my calling, then it's going to be natural, right? I'm just going to know what to do. I'm just going to know how to do it. So I wasn't sure how to proceed. So I just carried on doing what I was doing in the, in the sense of, okay, well, we'll keep exploring together, God. Maybe this is for me, maybe this isn't. I was a bit knocked by that. But I carried on. I volunteered with the Town Centre Chaplaincy at the Palace Theatre. I worked for Beach and Grove Baptist in the Town Centre as their community worker and buildings manager, and I did what I thought, all I knew to do, which was to love God and to love my neighbour. And then fast forward six years from that point, I get a job as a chaplain working at the YMCA in Watford, full time. Well, what happened in that intervening time? Well, God had used that as preparation to build my experience, to build my connections with YMCA. I used to do cooking classes with the residents. I got to know the staff and they got to know me. But I'd also grown in my life experience, in my personal growth, in my walk with Jesus, and I had a deeper understanding of what that looked like for me. So it wasn't wasted. So all of that knocked back, and then that preparation time was not wasted. But I have to be honest and say it was about six months into doing this that I realised all those people all that time ago were entirely right. I did need training. I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. And I wasn't able to explain clearly to people all the big questions they asked me about the Bible. Who is this Jesus? What, how does it all fit together? The life, death and everything in between questions. So I went and spent the next seven years distance learning with the London School of Theology. And I have to say God used that. Each module I did, each topic I did, was really relevant to what he was inviting me to do to love people at that moment in time. So the Holy Spirit helped me combine my experiences, my thinking, my study, all of those things in preparation for that call that I was given. And I just want to say and reassure you that I'm still figuring it out now, 11 years later. It's still not a completed work. But what about Jesus' example? Next slide, please. Okay. So if we just leave the passage where it is that Peter read to us, we are focusing just on the temptations that Jesus experienced in the wilderness. And that's important, but it's not the whole sequence. It kind of sits in the middle of these three stories. And the first one is Luke 3. It's the baptism of Jesus and the start of his ministry, where John baptises Jesus, the dove comes down, and the voice of God is heard, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And that's kind of like the public beginning of Jesus' ministry. Maybe if, you, if you've if you been baptised, that's your public declaration. I follow Jesus now. This is the start of my life with him. But if you haven't, but you say, actually, I, I choose to follow Jesus with my life each day, that's the start there as well. You're now following him. And then the Jesus is led into the wilderness, into this time of preparation, this time of thinking about the promises of God. And then we're led to Luke 4, to Jesus' declaration in the synagogue, which tells us what his ministry is about. I'll just share that with us as a reminder as well. Jesus said to them, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives, and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. So that's where he's heading to. But before that, 
there is this time of preparation. And we only know this, of course, and it's the same in the apostles' lives, in the disciples' lives, isn't it? They follow Jesus, and he prepares them, and then he sends them out. Then he gives them the Great Commission and the Holy Spirit as the one that supports them. But we know this because we're looking back on it. They didn't know that. So I just want to reassure you that if you're in that time of preparation, that's what God is doing as well. He's leading you forward. I just want to focus on a couple of the key things that jumped out at me while I was looking at this passage and reflecting on it. Thank you. Jesus is filled and led by the Holy Spirit. That's how he ends up in the wilderness. That's where he is led to where he needs to be. He chooses to follow. So, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, you will be where you need to be to be prepared. But I'm not going to promise you that that's easy or comfortable or lovely. But we can be reassured, Jesus says in John 14, 26, that the Holy Spirit is our guide and will remind us of all that he's taught. And I always realize, I often realise that because the Holy Spirit is our trustworthy helper, that actually it's not just scripture that the Holy Spirit reminds me of. In those really trying times, in those wilderness moments where I think, God, oh, what are you doing? Where are you? He reminds me of those times he's been faithful, those testimonies, those different stories we all of us have in our lives of where God came through for us. So Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to help us when we respond to God's call whatever that is. And it's into the wilderness. There's nothing fun about the wilderness at all. All our comfort, securities, ability to control the situation, because all of us as human beings want to stay in control, all of that is stripped away. And that can feel like there's actually no point to that. What, how is that actually going to help us? And I was thinking about one of the uh, people, one of our hostel residents that I got to know on our retreat course, our journey retreat course. And, uh, we were away on retreat and we were just kicking a football. That's all we were doing. We were just kicking a football to each other and we were talking about life. And he said, the thing is about losing everything, losing my job, like Nathan's story, that actually I realised what's fundamentally important to me is that I want to be a good dad. I want to be a good dad. I haven't been a good dad. I've been a terrible example to my kids, he said, but I have a new kid now and I want to be a good example to the kids I already have and my new kid as well. That's what I want for my life. So in that stripping back, he'd found and discovered what was important to him. In that wilderness time, all the things that were important were gone and the things that were really key for him um, have, were, were really, really shining through. Now, I can't tell you that that was a five-second kind of, yep, yeah, I've realised this now. He'd been homeless for probably about two to three years at this point. So a long time of having these things taken away from him. So the wilderness times can help us understand what's most important in our relationship with Jesus. I took my grandma on retreat about 10 years ago. My grandma was a great lady of faith. And on the first night of the retreat, uh, they go around and they ask you, they say, why are you here? It's a great question to ask. You're hoping by the end of the retreat time, being away and praying, that you'll have the answer to that question then. But they ask you at the start, why are you there? And uh, my grandfather, my grandma's husband, had died a couple of years before that. And she just said, it's still a painful experience, but um, I've come to ask God, what do you want me to do with the rest of my life? What am I called to do at 80? What do you want me to do, Lord, with the time you've given me left? So, the wilderness times, those times where you're not sure what's going on, help us to point us back to Jesus okay. and then the third thing okay. we're going to have to what's important and then the last thing Things. this is what happens when we're in those wilderness times Nigel next click please dealing with the distractions so Jesus is not going into the wilderness and having this marvellous time is he he's tired, he's hungry, he's alone all these things are happening and it's at that moment that there's that whisper isn't there this is what um, Tom Wright talks about, Tom Wright is a Bible scholar, and uh, I was reading up what he says about this passage, and he said it, so often we can think that the devil is standing there with Jesus, but actually maybe it's a whisper in Jesus' ear. Is this really what you want to be doing? Is God really here for you? And these are the kind of questions that the devil asks him. Okay, next slide please. Hungry. Are you hungry? Surely your father is good, and he doesn't want you to go without and Jesus says, life is more than bread. Then the devil says to me, you tired? How about taking a shortcut? You've been called 
You've got this ministry coming up. Ah, but that's too hard. Take a shortcut. Jesus says, but that means not following God. And he says, I alone are worth following. And then the devil says to him, are you alone? Don't you want to check that God's really here with you? Do you want to test him out? And Jesus says, God is faithful. We don't need to give him a test. So as I shared earlier from John's Gospel, the Holy Spirit is with Jesus and I imagine he's having Jesus remember all that he's been taught because Jesus here in each of his responses is quoting from Deuteronomy, which itself is Moses' last great section of teaching, reminding God's people in the wilderness how God had faithfully cared for them. When they put him to the test, when they said, is God really here? Did he bring something to the desert to die and God provides water? Jesus is saying, you know how good your father is. I know how good my father is. He's there for you. So being able to point, when we're being called and we're in the wilderness and we're like, Lord, are you there? Having those scriptures, having that, those stories to remind us and to hold on to and to say, but that's a lie because I know the truth about what God says about me and who he is, that he is faithful. And we can rely on the Holy Spirit to help us with that as well. And we also need that for when we step into whatever it is God is calling us into. So when Jesus was called, wasn't he? He says, I'm going to proclaim good news to the poor. I'm anointed. This is what I'm about. And actually, um, actually, without knowing those words this time, without being prepared, without having knowing the faithfulness and promises of God, it makes it then far harder to give that love, to care, to do whatever it is that God is calling us to do as well. And without those wilderness times as a church, I've been in places myself where there's a pastoral vacancy. What do you do? What is God calling us to do? How is he calling us to be? But actually, it's being able to understand that for ourselves and understand what God is calling us to do rather than relying um, on our human understanding, the human understanding of one particular person. So I just thought we'd give it a try to rebut some of the lies or the distractions that we might have as we're being called um, and then I have a reflective activity for us to do. So, next one. Okay, so you're going to shout out and then I can just repeat it back. So, uh, Jesus could never call someone like me to do this, whatever this might be. So, anyone got any scriptures or story from scripture that might help them if they're feeling like, actually, oh, can't be me. God's definitely not calling me to do this. He's chosen the wrong person. Yes, Beryl. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Any any Bible characters? Any any story? Moses. Moses. Yeah. How old was Moses when he was called? Eighty-four. Yeah, that's right. So if you're here and you're eighty-four and you're thinking God hasn't got anything for me to do, I'm afraid you're wrong. <laughs> so my, my grandma often reminds me. Well, he called Moses. Yes, grandma, he did call Moses, and you're ninety, so I should know better. Okay, yeah, that's right. Jesus could never call someone like me to this. And we see from the Gospels as well, doesn't he? He calls fishermen. He calls a zealot, someone who's a religious terrorist. He calls all sorts of people to follow him and to be and speak good news into the world. Okay, next one is, as we don't know... Sorry, go back one, Nigel, thank you. As we don't know what it will actually look like, this calling thing or the goal, or how we will get there, we should stop. No point going forward. We don't know what it's supposed to be. God knows. God knows. Yeah. Yeah. And I think about Abraham. This is what jumped to me. Because God says to Abraham, I'm going to take you to a place that I have not yet shown you. He also says, lean on me. That's it. Lean on me. Proverbs 3 verse 5. Mm. Yeah. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So we can get distracted, can't we? We say, well, we don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know where this is going to be in 10 years' time, so I'm just not going to do anything. I'm not going along for the ride because I'm not in control of it. I don't know. And so often, just like Moses as well, I'm going to lead you to the promised land, but I'm not going to show you what the promised land is. You're just going to have to trust me. And Jesus, with his disciples, with his first disciples, he even sends them out as the 72, brings them back in and gives them more training. So... Whatever you're feeling like, I haven't been given enough preparation, Jesus will give you more. And the last one. You, oh, you can't see it. It's disappeared behind the thing. But it says, the church is irrelevant. We aren't needed. Nobody needs the church anymore. Is that true? No. How do we know it's not true? 
Because we are the church. Yeah, you're here, right? Absolutely. But also because of Jesus is what Jesus said his ministry is about. I've come to preach good news to the poor, to those who go without, to those who feel life is hopeless. That's why I'm here. Are there people lonely in South Oxy? Yeah, are there people feeling without hope? Yeah. Do we work alongside those people? Are they our next door neighbours? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a lie. So anytime I see in the news, church attendance is declining, the church is irrelevant, I think that just galvanises me to want to do more. Of course it's not irrelevant. I know people who need God's love. So when God calls, stick with him. He'll prepare you. He will help you. He will show you and lead you in that way. And he is calling you to do something for him, whatever that is. So as a church and as individuals, that is my encouragement for us this morning. Now, I'm aware that we are running massively over time, possibly. I don't know. I don't know what usually happens. Oh, am I? Oh, good. Right, well, I'll start again and you can hear it all. No, you don't know. Not at all. Um, so, uh, what I'd like us to do is just take a moment to uh, do a bit of a reflective activity. I'm just going to grab my aid. So, on, uh, I'm going to give out some cards, some revision cards, don't worry. Uh, it's not a test on what I've shared. Okay, there won't be a quiz at the end. Should have given these out throughout, shouldn't I, really? But what I'd like us to do is just take a moment, and I'm going to ask three questions, which are as follows, and it will come up on the screen. Open it there already. What is God calling you or the church to do? Maybe it's a particular action. Maybe it's a kind of change of attitude or heart. Maybe it's to love a particular person or people group. Maybe it's to lay something down so you can more effectively take up the cross that your cross that Jesus invites you to. So what is God calling you or the church to? What is a distraction or a lie around this? What is that voice that you hear that says, it can't be this, or no, it can't be you? So just think, when, that, when those doubts creep in, what, is, what does that look like? What does that sound like? And then what scripture helps you to stick with Jesus in this? In this time where you're considering that calling, whatever that is, what scripture helps you to stick with Jesus in this? And I have to say, mine that's been with me throughout my time at YMCA was 1 Thessalonians 5.25. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. And I had to remember that this morning because I checked my work phone, and there was a message from a very senior colleague saying, oh, you know that project that you thought was going to happen? Uh, possibly it's going to go down the priority list. And we prayed, and we tried, and we prayed, and we tried. But I had to remember the one who calls us is faithful, and he will do this. We might just have to be in the wilderness a bit longer. That's all right. I think. I'll feel a bit better about it tomorrow. But the one who calls us is faithful. And he will do this. So it might be a scripture. It might be a remembering of a testimony. A time where God has come through for you. That you want to hold on to this. And then when you've, when you've done this. We'll give, you, give ourselves about five minutes to do this. Then take it away with you. Maybe in the time up to Easter. You want to put that on your fridge. Keep it in your Bible. Whatever you do. And just continue to say. Jesus I want to follow you. What does that look like? And to keep growing in that and to reflecting on that individually or as a church. So, um, there are some pencils at the back, but I don't know who's going to hand those. Oh, look at that. Linda's on it straight away. Yeah. Thanks, Linda. Jill, you can give out the cards. There we go. That's it. I have about, I have about 100 of them. So, but if I start on this side as well. If you're not a big writer and you'd like to just draw a picture or draw a mind map or a circle or whatever or just sit there and think about it, that is fine too. I will not take them in at the end and I will not be checking them. So the three questions. What is God calling you or the church to do? Maybe God's put it on your heart for you as a congregation, as a church, as the body of Christ. What is he calling you to do? Action, attitude to a particular people, group, location, activity to lay something down. What's a distraction or a lie around this? Think back perhaps to some of those that we had earlier in the desert, and Jesus in the desert. And then what scripture, what story helps you stick with Jesus in this to say, I keep following you.
Everybody happy? Well, I'm not going to ask you that question. Let me, let me rephrase that. Everybody know what I'm asking them to do. Is that okay? Are we all right with that? Great. I'll give you, give you five minutes to just to do that. And then we'll wrap up. couple of moments and then I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to have a song. <clears throat> of course free to take these away and carry on working on them as well. May we keep adding as God reveals more and more things to you. Feel free to carry on scribbling, drawing. I'm just going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we don't walk this road of life alone, that we do it with you. And I thank you, Jesus, that your call is simple in one sense. You just say, follow me. And I thank you that we're here because we want to understand more about what that's like. So help us to follow you, to be your disciples, to be and to speak good news to those who need to hear it. Thank you that you, as we sang at the beginning, are our salvation. We know this news is good because of what you have done for us. So Holy Spirit, remind us this week of those times in which you have been faithful and remind us of all that Jesus has taught so we can continue to be confident that the good news is good, that our salvation is assured and that you are at work in the world to bring light in dark places. And Lord, I do pray for the wonderful people here, for South Oxy Baptist Church. I thank you, Lord, for all that you are doing through them, individually and as a whole body before you. And I ask that you lead them, that you teach them, that you guide them, that you love them, so that they might follow you even more closely than they are right now. And Lord, if anyone here is in the wilderness time, I just ask that they will know your presence with them. They will be again reminded of your goodness and faithfulness and the unending and eternal love that you have for them. And as we go into this week, Lord Jesus, I just ask that you continue to do that and we continue to know your presence with us so closely in all things. We thank you that we can ask this in the name of of our holy and redeeming Saviour, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So you can reflect a bit more on that as the music group come and sing. Oh no, it's not, it's YouTube. Aha. Is that right? Send us out. No. Yes, no.
It is. Okay, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Let's send this out. don't fancy being sent out just yet and if you don't think God's finished with you in here yet please stay in here for prayer and there will be plenty of time for that and Matt's going to finish with the blessing thanks Peter the blessing is just one of my favourites and it felt right to share this morning so go forth into the world in peace be of good courage Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one, do to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help those in trouble. Show love to everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you, among us and remain with us always. Amen.